Hello and welcome to ONS Energy Talk. The topic of today is a sustainable energy transition. My name is Anne Ekan and I am your host this afternoon. Our guest at the ONS Energy Talk is Dr. Scott Tinker. Scott Tinker is a director of the 250 person Bureau of Economic Geology. He's also the state geologist of Texas and a professor at the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Scott Tinker is also the founder and chairman of the nonprofit Switch Energy Alliance. He has co-produced and is featured in the award-winning energy documentary film Switch and the new documentary Switch On, addressing global energy poverty. Dr. Tinker has visited 65 countries, including Norway, He's a recognized international speaker and serves on many boards. It's a great pleasure to have you with us at the ONS Energy Talk, Scott. Thank Anna, you for joining us from Austin, Texas. It's a treat to be here, and I'm so glad we can cross the ocean this way. <laughs> Thank you so much. So first and most importantly, how are you and your family and your team doing during this corona situation? Well, we're doing well. We've adapted. We moved the 250 people remotely and the switch team remotely. So uh, we're fortunate. We are all very fortunate. We have energy. We have modern technologies and we can adapt. Uh, not so for a lot of people in the world today, but, but for us, we have, and in fact, a lot of benefits and things we're learning from this, from this uh, global challenge that we're all facing. So thanks for asking. And I hope you and your family are the same. And, as always, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. So you kind of led me into this. So working and teaching and learning, it has all kind of changed overnight, right? And uh, both in the context of your role at the Bureau University and with regards to the Switch Energy Alliance. Um, so to what extent, what have been the most important changes so far? And to what extent do you think that these changes that we will continue to do things in different ways? Well, it's fascinating. I, I kind of come from the school of people do business with people, which means contact. And we've learned that we can have contact. It's not the same, obviously, but it certainly has opened up access to more people. Some of the things that we've been hosting at the Bureau, sessions and meetings that would have had 80 or 100 attendees have now had 300 attendees from around the world, people who couldn't have traveled before. So it gives access to a broader spectrum. It allows for engagement, these various tools that we use to do this. And I think in many ways, it will become a permanent part of our business to open things up like this, even though we may be meeting in person, as I hope we do at ONS, because I love engaging and interacting and, and watching people and, and learning and reacting to, to faces and expression. I think that's so important. But these tools that are made possible again by energy and technology, I think are going to become part of our, our future. Again, I'm talking about the modern world. There's five or six billion people out of the 7.5 or six that don't have tools like this. And, and that's the challenge is really to get everybody to a place where they can become more technologically and, and economically and, and hopefully socially equipped to to live the kinds of lives that everybody should be able to live. So we'll get back to the access uh, to energy a bit later. But I wanted to start talking about this radical middle. Um, <laughs> you often talk about the radical middle, so I was Thank hoping you. you could share a bit more with us what, what you're talking about there. You bet, you bet. I've been speaking for too long about energy and the economy and the environment. The three E's, I've called it a variety of things and published on that, but energy, the economy, and the environment. And the radical middle is really that overlap space that exists there where we look at components of each and try to understand the data and the nuance, some of the challenges, the willingness to, to engage in a safe space, but it's difficult conversations and to be wrong. But that's where the heart of the issues lie in so many things we do in the world today. So if we stay in our energy sphere or our, our economic sphere or our environmental sphere, we tend to get a little entrenched 
and wherever we are there and not get to those challenging problems in the middle. So I call it radical because sometimes it's lonely. You know, it seems, it seems we need to broaden the radical middle, not shrink it. And at times I feel today, particularly with the kinds of media and exchanges we have, that we get pretty mm, aggressive and dogmatic about our opinions of things and not so open to the perspectives of other components, both geopolitically, uh, geographically, educationally, resource access, and other kinds of things that influence uh, how we see the world and how the world really is, depending on where we are in that world. So it's that radical middle that I'm very passionate about, and it's hard. It's hard space, but I truly encourage all of us to think critically. And critically think, in critical thinking means looking at the pros and cons, or, or you know, the the pluses and the minuses of all sides of these issues because they all have them so that's the radical middle is is critically deep thinking and addressing real world problems very interesting and also i thought the the title of the talk today is sustainable energy transition was was um was uh, interesting too so i guess when you talk about the energy transition you're not simply talking about energy getting into something greener are you there's a wider perspective to it i'm guessing yeah, in fact, we'd have to define the words. What is green? And I do this a lot with students, particularly graduate students and, and, and all of us. We're all students at the end of the day. We use the word clean or green, and I will stop the conversation and say, what does that mean? And usually it takes a couple of sentences, but it gets, for the most part, to CO2 emissions into the atmosphere or other greenhouse gases. And that's fine. That's a big component of one of the environmental challenges today in the world is, is the human impact on the climate, okay? But it's not the only one. There are a couple other big pillars in, in environmental impact. Atmospheric, one to be sure, but how about local air emissions? As you will see in the film Switch On, we examine that closely. Just people cooking inside today with biomass of various kinds, wood and coal and dung. And you say, yeah, how many? It's a third of the world. It's over two and a half billion people today cooking inside with biomass and three million people a year are dying. Three million a year, more than malaria and AIDS combined, are dying from just breathing smoke inside their own homes and cataracts and lung cancer and kids with pneumonia. So local air emissions and then the use of the land, nature. We're all passionate about nature and as humans continue to expand and grow the population, nature becomes more encroached upon. Different forms of energy use different amounts of land and not just in their capture, but in the mining and other kinds of things that have to happen to create the things that capture energy. And finally, water. What, what's the water intensity of energy? So atmosphere, local air, land, and water are the four pillars of the environment that we have to protect and if we get too far out to one or the other, we tend to leave the other one potentially behind. So when I talk about a sustainable transition, it's lifting the world from poverty, maintaining healthy economies, and addressing the impacts on the environment of all forms of energy. And here's the trick. It's so tempting to say energy, environment. If we just get rid of some forms of energy, we'll clean up the environment. Unfortunately, it's not that way. It doesn't work that way. There's this little tricky thing called the economy that sits right there in the trilogy. So energy underpins healthy economies. Healthy economies invest in the environment. So when you start to think about, and the 65 countries I've been very fortunate to visit, the dirtiest environments in the world, almost without exception, are where it is poor. Simply can't afford to clean up the water. I don't drink the tap water. Clean up the soil, the local air emissions, three of the four pillars of the environment. And if you go look at clean air around the world, the maps and clean soils and clean water, it's where it's rich. We have regulations. We have governments that are stable. We can afford to invest in the things that relate to the environment. So that little dance, that energy economy environment is vital. And we just can't supersede that 
by trying to take away the economic components of it. Uh, it doesn't work that way, and it's never worked that way. So that's the radical middle, is trying to bring those together so that we can actually make sure we're both providing the kinds of, of things, stuff that you and I enjoy to the whole world and allowing the world to access that themselves while also maintaining and improving on the environmental impacts. And it's very solvable. It's, it's challenging, but it's very solvable. So with this, certainly one of the E's now being really, you know, uh, disrupted or shaken, you know, with the economy and everything that's happening to that globally. How, as your perspective in terms of the time, you know, that these things will take and your perspectives so on to what extent we can achieve um, feeding the world with energy changed? Yeah. I guess it has, but to what extent? <laughs> right, right. So if we're thinking about COVID specifically and, and one of the E's, which one? So, you know, let's talk about the economy first because we made a conscious decision as global governments to shut down the world's economy. Now, there are reasons that we have done that. I'm not arguing one way or the other on that. But the fact, the action we have taken is to shut down the engine of the world. Okay? We're all staying home. And that that allows some of us to work from home. I can work on my computer and I can engage. I'm wealthy. I being in, in developed nations. But a lot of people in developed nations can't. Many of the service industries are suffering mightily. You can't drive an Uber. You can't serve at a restaurant. You can't my father passed a month ago. You can't have funerals anymore. It's a service industry because we're not allowed to meet in public places. So we've taken the the economy and 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 said stop. <laughs> now the re there for every action <laughs> there is an equal and opposite reaction. <laughs> There's a few laws of, of physics that apply to the world as well, and this is one of them. So the reaction on energy has been what? We don't need as much energy. Our demand for energy has plummeted because we are not moving around. We are not running our factories and our industries the way we were. So we've seen the demand for coal in particularly Asia, which uses three times more coal than the rest of the world combined. Uh, oil and natural gas in developed economies. Nuclear power is still running the reactors, and so it's kind of providing that base load. We're not installing solar panels on roofs or wind turbines because we can't get out and work to do that anymore. The workforce has been shut down. So when you slow down the economy, the demand for energy plummets. We don't need the supply, uh, or we don't provide the supply that we once needed to. So as you take these systems down, <laughs> To meet, you know, to meet the dampened demand, price plummets. We have too much supply for a while relative to demand, so the price of these things has plummeted, and it has. Oil price went negative yesterday. That's never happened on the future spot market, but it went negative, okay? That's never happened. So you see these things happening. Now, what happens as we start to, and then in the investment in the environment, by the way, as economies suffer, and many are forecasting not just recession, potential global things that are worse. Others are not. We don't know. It's unknown how we'll come out of this. Lots of opinions about that. But, but as, we, as we dampen that economy, our ability to invest in the environment, and you read all sorts of things all over the board on this, is weakened as well. So how do we, what happens when the governments decide to turn on the engine again? Because this was a decision we all made to protect ourselves from the COVID-19 virus, what happens when we turn it back on? And it'll be differentially. China's already starting to, okay? Other economies are thinking about it. Some US states, not others. I'm guessing some European countries are gonna be ahead of others, parts of the rest of the world. So this differential engagement of the economic engine, it's gonna start pulling on energy again. When you turn it on, you need the fuel. You need to feed the, the engine of the world. And that, that food is energy. So what happens when we turn that on? 
is the demand starts to pull, supply has been cut back, and will supply lag or keep up with? And typically what happens when demand exceeds supply, supply struggles to keep up with it initially, and that pulls on price. So price goes from way down here to way up there, <laughs> and we hit this crazy cycle, this price cycle of energy now. And, and we'll see, you know, how quickly will it happen? To what extremes will it be geopolitically driven? Some forms of energy are fungible. Globally, we can move them around the world like oil on tankers. Others are less so, natural gas. Still, we're doing some with LNG, uh, solar and wind are, are, are regional, they're geopolitical. So how will this all play out? It's a fascinating thought exercise that many of us are going through. But I think that thinking about them in that radical middle sense is going to help us address them. And my guess is, this is just an opinion. Okay, I, I try to tell you when I'm giving you an opinion that doesn't have the data under it. So here's my opinion. Infrastructure takes a long time to build. So we came into this quickly, very quickly. We'll start to come out of it relatively quickly, differentially. The infrastructure hasn't changed. There's nothing that's gone on. We haven't changed any infrastructure in energy. So what was there before is what's going to be there after as we start to come out and, and each, each geopolitical region will use the resources that it has in energy and the infrastructure that it has to come out of the economic slump, recession. And that's probably how this will play out. And then we'll begin to see if we've learned things from this that we want to accelerate both in the marketplace and governmental uh, in terms of transition. So maybe I'm translating this into kind of a question, but imagine we're in a bit more normal situation and we were to consider different possible levers to speed up an energy transition, getting back to the title again. So alternatives may be, you know, one, government policies, two, technology and innovation, and three, which maybe is a stronger factor than it was pre-corona, are consumer customer preferences and value choices. Yes. Um, and you may want to add to this list. If we were to pick like the most important lever to speed up the energy transition, what would your, what would your take on that be? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we all probably define transition differently. Some would see it as a transition away from a certain set of fuels, coal, oil, and perhaps even natural gas. Coal is carbon, oil is complex hydrocarbon chains, and natural gas is really a hydrogen fuel. Methane is one carbon and four hydrogens per molecule. But you know, they're, they're fossil fuels. Um, some would see it as transitioning away from that to other things, okay, so a fuel change. And many describe that, particularly in Western Europe. I think that seems to be the strongest set of sentiments. Again, I would feel that that would be sort of like saying, and I'm going to be a devil's advocate for a minute, take a strong position. What if we had a, an energy form that we absolutely had to have and it, it used water and made it dirty and it, it, it polluted soils and streams and runoffs and, 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 and it was just terrible. And it's called food. <laughs> you know. It's, a, it's energy for our human bodies and our animals. It's, the energy unit is calories or kilocalories. But what, if, what if food did all sorts of bad environmental things? Well, it does. Agriculture is tough on the environment, but we're not gonna get rid of food, okay? It's the few, that's the fuel. What we will do and continue to do better is work on the things that are negative to the environment about food or agriculture. Use water better, better fertilizers, less fertilizers, maybe no fertilizers, manage the runoff, rotate the crops, soil, you know, all the agrarian and agricultural things we can do to improve soil use, et cetera, et cetera. So I want, I want us to think a little differently about getting rid of 85% of the world's energy, <laughs> coal, oil, and natural gas, that's what it is, and the growing parts of the world, the biggest economies, are still growing in coal. Vietnam is featured in Switch. 50 new 
coal power plants in the next 20 years, big ones, 400 megawatts. It's not going to change. So how do we clean up coal? How do we give them substitutions for coal, maybe natural gas or small modular reactors? Thinking through their whole hydro use and improving that, some solar in the southern part of Vietnam. There's jungle everywhere else, tough for solar and even wind. They're not going to cut down the jungle. So how do you start thinking about the impacts of energy and improving those? That, to me, is the transition. The impacts on what? The atmosphere, the land, the air, and the water. All four pillars. If, if we have too strong of a focus on one, if our, use an economic term, if our objective function is singular, then we will risk impacting the others more. It has to be done in a balanced way. So the transition itself, what are we accelerating towards? How do we speed up the transition first? We need to agree at some level on what we're transitioning towards. I think if we can agree that energy underpins economies and the world needs energy and is going to have it. So first we have to have energy for the world and that engine is growing. We can become more efficient, less use per person, do more with less, absolutely critical to it. That's a part of the transition. But providing energy, one. Two, cleaning up all forms of the environment. That's the transition. How do we accelerate to that? We begin to think about these things in an integrated way. You think about the system of the energy, environment, and economy, and therefore you put really bright minds from all sectors, not just technologists, scientists, and engineers, but social policymakers, uh, business minds, legal, uh, um, you know, human thinking. Uh, you mentioned culture. It's a huge part of it. How often do we think about the energy we use? I think you do a wonderful job in Europe of that, better than almost any others in the world. You think about the energy. That's so critical. We do a terrible job in the United States. You know, we just use energy. Um, getting better, but a lot of education. And then there are parts of the world that are just getting started. So cultural components, technology components, and certainly the economic components all weigh in. But if we continue to promote the transition is getting off of 85% of the world's energy, fossil fuels, and only going toward intermittent energy, solar, wind, waves, tides, I think we have, we risk very strongly failure because the world, and I'm just going to be candid here, the growing world isn't going to do that. The data are in. Asia, which produces more and more of the world's products now, is not going to do that. We have to help them understand the technologies and the impacts, the cleaning up the energy that they're using and that we have used and are going away from as they go. That takes a healthy economy. So this is a this is a little bit different kind of transition, perhaps, than is being discussed. But that's what I'm here for, is yeah. to push us to think. It's very interesting, and it's very easy for us being privileged, as you say, to, you know, don't understand all of those complex issues and, uh, and to be selfish in all of this, too. We're well, we, 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 we take some things for granted. Let me give you a very interesting example, some data here. I made a plot and I adapted it from some other plots, but, and it looks at the economies in the world and their CO2 emissions, puts it on a chain. We emit about 36 gigatons, 36 billion tons of CO2 humans do into the atmosphere every single year globally. And, and on one side of this plot is a group of countries that consume more stuff than they produce. And it's mostly the OECD the rich nations, the club of rich nations. And on the other side of this plot are a bunch of nations that produce more stuff than they consume. It's mostly non-OECD, developing Asia, parts of Latin America, even countries in Africa starting to come into that now, Middle East, etc. A group that consumes more than they produce and a group that produces more than they consume. Very interesting. Well, how does that all yeah. balance? Well, the producer. Yeah. The producer sends stuff to the consumers. We consume it. I'm wearing probably everything I'm wearing was made somewhere in Asia and, and half of the products that I'm using right now. What does that do? And I'm going to ask it in CO2 terms. 
What does that do? How many atmospheres are there in the world? There's one. So if a group of countries who have lower regulatory regimes and restrictions than another group is making the stuff that you and I consume, if our plan for zero emissions is to have other people make our stuff and send it to us cheap, how is that helping climate? In fact, on a per unit basis, the CO2 emissions is worse. So that per unit consumption is worse. So that takes me into a question I had noted on the CO2 um, taxes, because a lot of people are saying post uh, Corona, we'll see carbon being priced. Um, and of course, in Norway, we have carbon taxes. Uh, I know you and you kind of led into that, saying that CO2 taxes aren't necessarily the solution to things. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I can, I can uh, publish some things on that. You can check out a Scientific American piece just not many months ago. Norway did something that is extremely admirable. You took your oil and gas royalties and invested them in a wealth fund. Okay, That fund is now a trillion dollars. Texas didn't do that. We have royalties and we spend them. Most places on earth did not do what Norway did. And there are reasons that others struggle, et cetera, we can go into all that. But in fact, that's what Norway did. So you sit on top of a trillion dollar wealth fund that now provides uh, significant annual returns to Norwegian citizens, okay? It allows you to think in ways that most others can't. Now that movement, that shuffle has been interesting. It's been toward socially, <laughs> you know, left, let's just say as you sit on this wealth fund built on the back of oil from the North Sea. Isn't that interesting? Most countries don't have that. In fact, no one I know on a per capita basis has anything close to that other than perhaps the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but it's hurting now too. So you have a set of ways of thinking about the world that's, that's broad, but based on your own experiences, okay? Um, taxing carbon is an interesting thought experiment. What does a tax do? A tax on anything. Well, on the surface, it's simplest, it raises the cost of something. If I tax it, the price goes up. Government takes some rent off of that cost, that price, and government gets some revenue from it. We tax a lot of things. It makes sense. Okay? Government revenue that way, including taxing income. We have income tax <laughs> that we all pay and, and property tax and all sorts of sales tax, 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 tax. So if we tax carbon, we put a price on carbon, government gets a set of revenues. It raises the price of that thing that uses carbon, okay? If in a simplest world, when you raise price in theory and in actuality, you dampen the demand for that because it's more expensive. I'm going to use a little less because it costs more. Makes sense. Simple economic terms. What if it didn't cost more? What if raising the price on something here, country A, caused us to buy it just as cheap as we ever bought it from country B? You know, What if I could just get that same thing from country B? And they don't have a price on carbon. Oh. That's what we're doing. I just described it earlier. So, oops. And you say, well, we'll tax the thing that we bring in from country B at the border. And that's the scheme is we'll, we'll put border taxes on everything so that country B has to price it differently. And in theory, that sounds interesting. But if you start to look at how that's played out in practice globally, it's, it's very rare that it has worked that way. In fact, that it's worked very well at all. And I have big discussions with my fellow economists. I'm not an economist, but my fellow resource experts. I actually know some things about resources, about this, this topic. And in the near term, the 5, 10, 15, 20 year term, it's going to be very difficult to see balances in that. And our climate scientists 
and our climate models tell us we have to have some action in 10 to 20 years. Otherwise, we risk temperatures that far exceed one and a half to even three degrees C to the climate. So if the, if the, if the tax over here caused a price structure that in fact made more stuff made here than is even happening today, and the emissions per unit of stuff go up, our intentions are good, our outcomes aren't. And we've actually seen that happening in some countries that are very passionate about emissions and climate. You have one, the largest one in Europe, Germany. Germany's emissions were coming down, CO2 emissions, nuclear was increasing, natural gas was increasing, coal was coming down, wind markets were growing. It was working well till about a decade ago. Everything was on track. And then a new set of policies, Energy Vanda, you know, Redux or 2.0 or whatever you want to call it came in. And Germany and parts of Western Europe got worried about hydraulic fracturing, fracking. So natural gas was, went out of favor, better to import it from Russia. And then Fukushima Daiichi happened. And so nuclear, everybody got scared. And yes, it's nuclear in Japan, which is a tectonically active region with volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunamis may not be so good. Germany is pretty stable interior Kraton. I'm a geologist, I can talk about these things. Not so bad for nuclear, but nonetheless, moratoria nuclear. So when you take natural gas power, nuclear, <laughs> what, and the wind is growing more steeply, you have to have something when the wind isn't blowing because it doesn't always blow. And what happened was more coal and I tell Germans this and they say, no, it can't be, but now they actually know this. So the CO2 emissions that were coming down actually flattened for the last decade. And in addition to add insult to injury, the price of electricity climbed because it turns out turbines are cheaper, but the integrated cost, uh, cost of electricity when you have a lot of renewable energy in the system, like we have in Texas, tons of wind here, more than any other state times two or three. When you put that cost into the system, because it's not always blowing, you have to have redundant stuff, batteries or natural gas plants or something to back up the load when the wind isn't blowing. And that redundant stuff is expensive. It's not on always. So when it's on, it costs a lot of money. So the integrated cost, the price for electricity that you and I pay in our homes is more. We have to be honest about this. It's more. Germany pays 30 cents a kilowatt hour. That's three times Texas. Okay. And we pay more because of the wind than we used to pay, six or seven cents. So this is, this is the radical middle looking at the actual cost of things when you put all of it into the system. And when I talk about gasoline, I go on a diatribe, ga gasoline, electricity, particularly things in energy, we all pay the same price for those in our different regions. If I make $100 a year and somebody else makes $10 a year and we pay the same for gasoline and electricity, it costs them a greater percentage of their income than it does me. That's called regressive. That is the definition of regressive. Okay. So the, when, when we're subsidizing anything, but let's say battery manufacturing and electric vehicles, solar panels and wind, et cetera, where our intentions are good, but who pays, who puts that in? Well, wealthy people, I can afford those things. A Tesla in my garage if I wanted one, solar panels on my roof if I wanted them. They're subsidized by everyone who can't afford them, who make less money are paying for my Tesla. Does that seem right? It, it, you know, it, it morally right, it should, should, should we put regressive costs on, on, the, on people to do this? And, and again, I think this is, this is really important to think hard about as we go through these conversations, because some things look good on the surface. Let's tax carbon and we will price it up and everything else will happen. Well, everything else means building some things that don't have emissions. They may have impact on the land and other environmental impacts. Well, let's say they're, it's better for the environment, but, but is it really? Or do we just move things somewhere else and 
and what happens to our one atmosphere. So this is this complex interplay. This is the radical middle in action. And, and I'll, the last piece I'll say on this is where does it come from? You know, if, as we think about these clean collectors, the sun and the wind are renewable and clean, very much so. But I've got to collect them, so I have to build turbines and build solar panels and build batteries to back those things up if we're not going to use natural gas, nuclear, or coal to back them up. So I build batteries. So where do the stuff to make batteries and wind turbines and solar panels come from? comes from the earth. We mine it. I'm a geologist. I love mining. <laughs> Whatever. You don't grow it, you mine it. But as you start collecting the sun and the wind and backing it up with batteries, and particularly if we electrify our vehicle fleet with batteries, which is a whole different conversation, it comes from the earth. We mine it. We are already seeing great studies coming out on the, on the significant increase in mining that's going to go on as we build these collection systems. And then we manufacture them, just like we do in oil and gas. I mean, oil and gas isn't clean. You mine the stuff to make pump jacks and, and the pipelines to transport it and the refineries and, the, you know, and then the cars and the emissions. I mean, it has all the same challenges, okay? But the mining, because it's so, the sun and the wind are low density, we need a lot of stuff to collect them. Oil and gas are dense. Wind and solar are not dense. So more stuff to collect them. And then where does it go? Well, we're already burying wind turbine blades in the United States. They wear out after 10 to 20 years and, you, and they're a composite polyfiber, you know, so they're not toxic, but they're giant. So we're burying them. Not so batteries. Batteries are toxic, Hunt like 50 to 100 toxic gases. And we talk about recycle and reuse. We don't do that much of that with batteries. We bury them in landfills. So when you start going from a few billion for our cell phones to trillions of batteries for vehicles, trillions, 600 million cars times 5,000 batteries a car, 3 trillion, okay? And big batteries to back up solar and wind. The environmental impacts on nature are not trivial. And I get a lot of people probably throwing things at the screen right now, I'm sorry, but it's not trivial, it's just different. Okay, it's just a different mechanism to power things. Electricity in a battery is just different from gasoline or hydrogen in a fuel cell. These are our options to move things around or generate electricity. And they all have impacts that are different from one another. But as we scale them up, they're not trivial. So that's the transition discussion that is going on. Thoughtful people are having it across the space. But it's not an easy one. It doesn't mean it's not solvable. It's just not an easy conversation. It's not a simple conversation. It's not a shut down this, do that. We're stupid if we don't. I hear that conversation too. And I don't say much to it, but I, I encourage us all to think about the interplay of all these things. Cause I think we all truly want to clean up the environment. We all live in it. Okay. And that's the, that's the ground I give is we all have pretty good intentions about these things and different approaches to getting to the ends. And that's, uh, that's what I think is so vital, particularly for young people, Anna, that in college and, and graduate schools and early in careers is to get the information they need to address and, these things for real. Okay. Yeah. And that was where I was going to get a switch in topic into the switch actually, because, okay. um, we touched on energy poverty, which is such a huge and heartbreaking issue for so many people. And um, you, you know, I mentioned Switch, the energy documentary that has been screened in 50 countries, I believe, 15 million people, and it's still, it's still out there being watched. And you recently made Switch on, and you do a lot of energy education as part of the work in the Switch Energy Alliance. So I wanted you to say a bit, you know, about the work, about the mission. Uh, about what kind of conversations you want to trigger through all of this to round off this conversation today. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I think the most important part of an energy conversation is to try to make it nonpartisan and to try to make it objective with information, data and facts as much as possible and some well-grounded, fact-checkable stuff so that we can say, yeah, that sounds good, but let's look at the data and what does it show? 
what are our intentions, what were our intentions and what were our outcomes? Some followed the intentions, others unfortunately didn't. So how do we change and adapt? So the, the goal, the vision of the Switch Energy Alliance is to inspire an energy educated future. That's it, inspire an energy educated future at all levels. We're targeting K through 12, university campuses, the public in museums and through our films, uh, decision makers, policy makers, the broad public with information, mostly video based. So we have great films. We've Switch was filmed in 11 countries, Switch on in five countries, um, access to some of the top thinkers in the world. And we really are trying to, to we, we actually peer review our films. We send them out and we adapt them and change them to make sure we're not showing or saying anything that isn't fact-based. There's a lot of powerful documentaries in the world. Unfortunately, some, some of them just are true. <laughs> you know, documentary doesn't mean factual. The filmmaker can tell you whatever story they would like to tell and they can film it and somebody's saying something that seems like it's a fact, but when you weave it all together, you can tell a story that isn't. And real. this is all available to everyone. It's free. It's on the switchon.org website. So we have the feature link films, we have all our, our primers and 101s, we have energy labs. Switch on is now through a virtual screening room. Anyone can watch it. Open a virtual screening room for your family, for your giant company. I was talking yesterday, the director of the USGS, who's a good friend of mine, Jim Riley, former astronaut. They got 9,000 employees. They're gonna try to do a virtual screening room for the USGS. Great, you know, you, it doesn't matter the numbers. You come on and you set a VSR up on the Switch On site, you can put your own logo and brand and you don't have to watch it at the same time. You get 30 days, watch the film. And then we have these open, I'm doing one this afternoon actually, an open Q&A online to anybody who wants to. We just talk, ask me anything type questions. And I learn from those so much. So I think these the, the Switch portfolio, which started about a decade ago, has really gone global. It's in thousands of university campuses now, and teachers love our materials. The lab itself, I'm in a goofy white lab coat with goggles doing experiments. How does a battery work? Can we make a battery? <laughs> you know, what's in frac fluid? And we dump the stuff in. And it just, it's there for us to learn more so we can, so we can change the way we think about energy. And we all have very strong opinions. I mean, look, if I'm a, if I, if I have a neural surgeon problem, I have a brain problem, which I might, and I need a neural surgeon, I don't go tell the neural surgeon his business. You know, I kind of trust that person, but we all have these strong opinions about energy. Somehow we are all experts and that's okay. But if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna all have our strong opinions, we need to get educated about energy, truly educated. And that's what Switch is intended to do through our various media is to provide you with the information. I take all of my, I give lots of talks with PowerPoint slides that are really nice. I animate them and layer the data with references. They're all available online. You can go to Switch On, you can download the PowerPoints. There's 20 different topics. Make your own talk, adapt the slides, check them, update them, whatever you want to do to get out there, educate yourself, and begin to educate others. So that's my passion because I think it, it energy underpins everything in the world We've got to have an educated conversation about it so we can so we can improve the future for our kids and help our kids and their kids live healthier, better lives. And I don't mean just my children. I mean the kid, the children of the world. And we visit those and switch on. And it is tough. It's emotional. It's difficult to see in today's world the circumstances of so many people. And we can change this. We can, we can improve this. We can help them help themselves. Thank you so much for sharing all of these perspectives. And it sounds like, you know, that if all of us take part in that uh, discussion, that maybe we'll be closer to the, the answers to all of that. Thank you so much, Scott. Really appreciate right. you participating. And everybody heard about the opportunity to ask you questions directly on webinars and uh, dwell into switchon.org. Mm -hmm. um, sorry we didn't have more time, but I really appreciate you connecting with us. Absolutely, and I hope to see you in person at the end of August. <laughs> we certainly hope so. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take good care.
Thank you, Anna. for watching the ONS Energy Talks. Um, please watch our streams every Tuesday and every Thursday at 2 o'clock and at ons.no. Thank you so much.